What's up, Wisconsin? I'm Aidan. You are listening to the Civic Media Radio Network. Happy Friday, everybody. Um, I thought we would start today. We got a big show for everybody. Uh, we got some fun guests coming in. And of course, I got to talk about 420 Day. Don't worry, we'll get there. But I wanted to start today off by talking about the RNC. Um, we've we've got a wee bit of a convention coming on you. You know, just, just just a wee one, yeah. It should be it should be real boring, sort of very stuffy affair, don't you think? I I don't in, I don't think I'll see anyone in costumes walking down the street or any sort of inflatable signs. No, I'm sure this will be a peaceful, quiet affair. Yes, very yes, quiet, yes, yes. very staid affair. Yes. Um, yeah, like no controversy at all. No, why would no? Of no. course not. No. Uh, well, we all know that that the lid's going to get blown off this one in a good way. We all hope. I have been all along very pro RNC in Milwaukee. I like uh, to believe that here in Wisconsin. And amongst all Americans, we value the ability to disagree with one, one another peacefully um, and that that is the root of our freedoms, that freedom to disagree, to discuss, uh, even maybe to argue, <laughs> and to do that with respect and um, hopefully both passion, but also level headedness. And again, most of all, peacefulness and I, I was excited not only to see the RNC come to Milwaukee because of the economic boost. I love this city. I love this state. It it really will put the state and the city in a national spotlight. We need more of that every time, every chance we can get it. Um, and I'm excited to see what it's going to bring. I'm certainly excited as somebody who talks about politics a lot to, to see that happen. And of course, Civic Media will have coverage for you during the RNC. But my question for all of you, this Friday afternoon, sunny, if a bit cold here in the WAUK, is what are you doing for the RNC? Are you sticking around or are you getting the heck out of Dodge? 855-75-CIVIC, 855-752-4842. What are you doing for the RNC? Are you staying? Are you going? Are you Rent? Are you Airbnb being your place? Are you getting a pretty penny for it? Um, and are you excited for it in a positive way? Or is this the looming sense of dread? I've heard from some of my friends the looming sense of dread. Um, and the reason that I ask is just today, uh, early this morning, the Journal Sentinel posted an article talking about the ordinance that has been adopted in the city of Milwaukee, along with their permitting process for demonstrators and protesters. And I thought, this is really interesting because there's some angst, there's some pushback. And of course, it wouldn't be without some interesting legal questions as well, because there was a lower court ruling that the U.S. Supreme Court let stand just this past Monday that has an impact on protester organizers or protest organizers, as I should say, march organizers. So I'm going to get into that. I'm going to share all this detail, what the controversy is at the city of Milwaukee. Um, But I I wanted to ground the conversation in, in, in what you all are interested in. What are you doing? Are you staying? Are you going? Are you Airbnb being your, your, your flat out or verbo or your chosen platform? There's a million of them now. Um, Do you think this will be a net positive? I sure do. 855-75-CIVIC, 855-752-4842. My belief is that 99% of us want to be able to engage and have these conversations and are not inclined to violent outbursts. Um, And that that's what I think if, if I'm a Republican leader, a MAGA leader even, I want the RNC to 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 occur in that way. I can't speak for the former MAGA president because I really don't think, um, you know, that question is centered in his mind at the moment. I also just don't think the former MAGA president thinks in those terms about how do I help us ensure that we can have a peaceful convention and that my nomination will, will be both celebrated for my supporters, but also be an opportunity to engage in peaceful disagreement with, with those 
uh, on the other side of the aisle. I just don't think that's part of Donald Trump's makeup. But I think for the vast majority of other folks, conservatives, Republicans, MAGAs, um, they, they do want this to be positive, uh, an economic lift for the city and a peaceful uh, national nominating convention. But what do you think? 855-75-CIVIC, 855-752-4842. Maybe I'm being naive on you. What, 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 what's your take? What do you, what's your feeling as we approach the RNC? Well, I'll say back when the back when the DNC was supposed to happen here, uh, I did have thoughts about maybe renting out my couch as a Airbnb because I was seeing just how quickly the hotels filled up. I think the only hotel that wasn't full up was the the Sybaris down in uh, or up in uh, Mequon. That Ooh. was the only place I saw Sybaris. a headline that was like CNN correspondents forced to book room. Man, I was like, oof, that's terrible. So other than a, a terrible situation like that for people coming in, um, I'll take your couch. I'll yeah, skip the Sybaris, yeah. go with Anya's couch. Yes, M- most most definitely. But my <laughs> hope, too, is that in public, in the places outside of hotels and where people are staying, my hope is that things will be calm. Uh, but I always hope for the best and sort of prepare for the worst. I'll phrase it like that. Yeah, I think that's a useful rubric. But let me explain to everybody a little bit what is going on here, what we're seeing in this bit of controversy. Again, kind of in the weeds, but that's where I like to go with y'all. Um, so there was a, a recent meeting on the city's south side um, about the ordinance relating to protests and permitting and the permitting process itself for RNC marches, demonstrations, protesters. Um, and there seems to be, these are the three issues that, that I'm seeing and hearing from this debate that's occurring. Uh, one, some people believe that the ordinance adopted by the city of Milwaukee creates potential liability for bad things that might happen for protest organizers. In other words, say you're anti-MAGA and you want to have a big protest at the RNC, that if there's some altercation with other, say, supporters of the MAGA president, something goes wrong, or an altercation with law enforcement, that the people that organize the protest, even if they didn't do the bad thing or whatever it is, could be legally liable and have to pay damages if someone got hurt. So that's issue number one. Um, People are concerned about the fact that police agencies from outside Milwaukee will be there, and they're questioning whether or not those agencies will be required to wear body cameras. Interesting question, I do think, right? It speaks to kind of like community policing. If someone's coming from somewhere else, are they going to treat the people who are here well? Correct. And of course, that then begets the debate about how long does the police department have to release video footage from body cameras or otherwise after a quote unquote critical incident? Somebody gets shot by police or um, hurt or there's some violent incident involving uh, a member of the public and police related to this convention. So, again, issue number two has two parts. One, are the police from out of town going to have to wear body cameras? And two, when will the police have to release the footage? Issue number three, I feel like this is the McLaughlin group. Issue number one. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's some SNL back from the 1980s. Issue number three, if I may, is if you're arrested protesting, where will you be taken? How? Where are you going to be processed? Now, because I was around during the DNC planning as the chief legal officer of Milwaukee County, and was there still up until March. I know a little bit about this stuff. The best practice, and we know this from observing um, other conventions when it comes to issue, issue number three, which is where are people processed, is that you process folks who are arrested as speedily as you can. So you're effectively ticketing and releasing. You will process people like away from the convention area. So usually they pick a school gymnasium or something like that. Um, and oftentimes they actually employ um, colored wristbands. Think, you know, the, the Live Strong ones back before Lance Armstrong became a pariah for being a cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater. And everybody had those yellow rubber wristbands. 
they, they do something like that that sort of indicates either the, the ticket that the person is receiving or whether or not they actually need to be detained. The idea here would not be to detain a lot of folks. The idea here is to get people ticketed and processed and released unless the crime or the incident was so violent that release would not be appropriate. So I do know a little bit about the answer to issue number three. Now, here's here's where we're at. So this meeting happened, um, I think, about a week and a half ago. About 30 people from about a dozen organizations uh, got together at the Tippy Canoe Library in uh, on the south side of Milwaukee. Again, we're talking this half hour on the Maggie Dawn Show about the upcoming RNC. Are you excited for it? Are you worried about it? 855-75-CIVIC, 855-75-24842. Are you sticking around? But what brought this to my attention is, yeah, we all know what's happening. Preparations are being made. But there's this debate happening at the city. So one of the uh, folks that are that are raising questions is a co-chair of the Coalition to March on the RNC 2024, Omar Flores. And he wants the ordinance that the city adopted that cre- that has the permitting process that explains sort of the qualifications to get a permit, um, those kinds of things. He wants it repealed and he wants to change the permitting process. And here's what's in the ordinance and permitting process that's got everybody's hackles up, if you will. The language requires that those seeking a permit to say whether the requester or any person in the group or organization, quote, previously engaged in violent or destructive conduct in connection with a previous parade or other public assembly in violation of any provisions of the Milwaukee Code of Ordinances or any state or federal laws. Okay. Now, we can understand perhaps where this came from, right? After January 6th, you don't want the Proud Boys showing up at the RNC. We're going to take a couple quick messages. When we come back, I'm going to dig into what's going on there, what the concerns are, and why this Supreme Court decision from Monday may make all of this just a pedantic argument. I'm Maggie Dawn. You're listening to the Civic Media Radio Network. We'll be back with more after these brief messages. You know who's the best? Everybody listens to Civic Media, and especially the Maggie Dawn Show. I'm Maggie Dawn. She's Anya Esther. It's Friday afternoon. TGIF, everybody. I'm talking about the RNC that's coming up and a bit of controversy surrounding the city of Milwaukee's ordinance relating to protesting and marching at the RNC. Specifically, it includes a provision that basically says, hey, are are you a protest or march organizer? organizer has anybody affiliated with your organization been involved in basically any violent or destructive conduct at any prior public assembly this clearly in response to january january 6th and the proud boys and the the, the three percenters and the boogaloo bo- i lose track of all the wackadoo groups um who staged a violent insurrection and you know you don't want hate groups there Now, hate groups have a right to show up and say hateful things. But what what Mr. Flores, who is the co-chair of the Coalition to March on the RNC 2024, saying is that all of a sudden now march organizers have to be responsible for the past behavior of every person who may participate in the march, the protest, what have you. Um. This is really interesting. I'd make an argument that arguably that liability may exist already. And what the city is doing is saying, be warned. You got to know who's going to show up at your march. Now, that in reality may be very difficult. You promote things on social media. You can't control necessarily who who sees it. 
Does this mean that organizers don't use public posts that you have to subscribe to like a private Facebook group that they have to screen people? Is that where we're at? Is that good for public discourse? Anya's looking uncomfortable. It kind of reminds me of when I went to D.C. to cover the the big the big March for Israel thing that happened. It's like, well, yeah, there was security. You had to be on a list. You went through and it's like. So for something of that scope where there were almost 300,000 people, uh, I understand why that march of that size you had, you really did register everybody yes. who was going in. It was a lockdown thing in D.C. But I really, I this doesn't sound like something, I think that a smaller group that's working on a more local issue, there's like 10 or 12 folks. This sounds like a really big deterrent to them doing like what they are allowed to do. Well, so, this yeah. is, this is, and I talk about this, Frequently, and that is in any issue that matters, what you're going to have is two values that we as Americans, as Wisconsinites, think are important, but they're actually at odds. And we're trying to figure out how to balance these two values or principles that are at odds. Here are free speech, this core freedom. I began by saying my hope is that the RNC is peaceful and that we can demonstrate to ourselves, most importantly, that we can disagree with one another and engage in, 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 political discourse, sometimes have vehement disagreements, but yet do so peacefully. So the the things that are at odds here, and I understand where the Common Council and the city is coming from, is is our, our First Amendment freedom of speech and our need to have safety, right? These are the things at odds. Now, unfortunately, it's my, I, I believe my opinion is we don't see this kind of restriction. Anya doesn't have that experience in D.C., except for the fact that the MAGA president fomented and has brought us to the brink of violence. And we're seeing increasingly violent rhetoric, largely from the far right. And now we have this greater th threat to public safety when we have these large political um, events occurring wherever they may be, whether it's in Charlottesville or the city of Milwaukee. And so what's, what's interesting in the little bit of wonk that I wanted to share was that the Supreme Court this past Monday left a lower court ruling in place that found a Black Lives Matter protest organizer could be sued by a police officer who is injured by an unknown person participating in a Black Lives Matter march. So think about that. You are politically engaged. You post, let's have a march. Let's, let's have a parade. Let's protest. Lots of people show up. You don't know who all of them are. Somebody, whether they came there with bad intents or they're a rabble rouser, whatever it is, ends up in a physical altercation with someone else, maybe law enforcement, maybe a counter protester, and that person is hurt. You never figure out who the the tortfeasor is. There's a word for you. Tort bad actor, the person who, who harms someone else. Tortfeasor. Little legal minutia on Friday afternoon. And you, the organizer of the protest march, whatever, rally, you get sued. Supreme Court this past Monday let that the idea that you can be sued. There wasn't a finding of liability yet, but that the suit could proceed against that organizer. So to me, the city ordinance isn't creating liability. It's just saying you should try to figure out who the heck's going to show up at your protest. To me, that seems to be a reasonable balance given what has happened in our most recent history, given where the rhetoric is. I would not want to see this on a permanent basis, as Anya was saying, for any sort of organized rally, protest, march, what have you. Um, again, this, this gets into the minutia of, well, how do we actually hold an RNC? What are the logistics here? So to share some of that, logistics so you can be prepared. Um, I'll be around. I'll be covering it with my civic media colleagues, with Anya for you. Um, but here's some logistics. First of all, the city hasn't released the route that demonstrators or protesters will be allowed to march or the particular location of the quote-unquote speaker's platform 
for protesters and marchers. Um, though I can tell you from the DNC, Pear Marquette Park was is nearly certainly going to be where the speaker's platform is. Okay, so Pear Marquette Park nearly certainly going to be where the speaker's platform is. The locations of the parade route will be, according to officials, within, quote, sight and sound of the downtown venues where the convention will be held and will be inside what is called sort of, there's a hard barrier, a hard security barrier, and then there's sort of a softer outer limit. You got to be literally credentialed and, and screened to get within the hard barrier. And then the, the, the outer ring, a little bit more, uh, less security, less screening, but that those, um, that parade route will be within that soft perimeter. Um, now, by the way, that soft perimeter zone stretches from Cherry Street on the north to West Clyburn on the south and from North Water Street on the east to 9th Street on the west. So it's basically surrounding Fiserv, uh, the Baird Center, and the UW Panther Arena. Those are the three event spaces for the RNC. So that's what we've got it a little you know, heads up, little watch this space, if you will, for everybody out there in the civic media listening audience for the upcoming RNC. This is going to be fascinating to me, both as a lawyer, um, someone who finds p politics to be endly fa endlessly fascinating, and as a Milwaukeean who wants this to be a rousing success for all involved, including every visitor, resident, and citizen of the city and surrounding area. We're going to be back with members of the Milwaukee Chamber Theater. There is an incredibly fascinating play that's starting very soon. Keep it locked. Your Farm Report is next, and we'll talk a little arts when we come back here on The Maggie Dawn Show. I've been a puppet, a pauper, a pirate, a poet, a pawn, and a queen. I've been up and down and over and out. Does it make you want to give jazz hands? Maybe take a bow? I'm Maggie Dawn. You're listening to the Civic Media Radio Network. Really excited to be joined this half hour by two artists, actors with the Milwaukee Chamber Theater, who on April 26th will premiere, I believe it's the world premiere, the play, The Not-So-Accidental Conviction of 11 Milwaukee Anarchists. Say what? I'll try that again for you. The not-so-accidental conviction of 11 Milwaukee anarchists and my two new friends, King Kane and Kelsey Elise Rodriguez, here from the Milwaukee Chamber Theater to tell me all about it and you all about it. Welcome, fans and friends. So nice to have you here. Thank you for Hello. having us. Thank you for having us. Uh, happy Friday. Happy Friday. Um, What's the play about? Okay. So... It's about four actors who are commissioned to write a play based off of a historical event that happens in Milwaukee. Okay. And so they choose to pick an event that has relevance to today because no one wants to just see some random copy and paste story off of Wikipedia, right? Yes. So they pick this event that took place in 1917. It was a bombing at a police station, primarily because it still grapples with the things that we grapple with today. It grapples with injustice, mm. political unrest, immigration, things that are very much at the forefront of what we are dealing with as a country. And so with that comes four very different storytellers mm. trying to tell this one story in a way that's truthful, fun, funny, heartbreaking, and... That's where it all begins. It's sort of a play within a play, right? Yes. It's, it, yes. There's no yes. fourth wall, but there's a fourth wall. <laughs> yeah. Well, we break that fourth wall pretty quickly. Okay. Yes. So yeah, there yeah. is that audience interaction element, which is very exciting. Well, audience interaction. What's that like for you, King, as an actor? It, it, because it is a bit extemporaneous. You don't know what you're going to get. Sometimes audiences are like, what? "Are you are you talking to me? What's what's happening now?" Yeah, you know, people. We we ask. In the, in the show, we ask a lot of questions directly to the audience, hoping we get some sort of response, you know? Yep. Uh, and sometimes they're a little unhinged. Sometimes they're exactly where <laughs> yes. we want them to be. And yes. sometimes it's completely left field, you know? Yeah. And so 
it's great for us because that means the show is different every night. Yeah, it yep. keeps uh, it fresh you know? for you. Mm-hmm. And we're on our toes the entire time, knowing that we have a point where we want to lead them to. Yes, you know? yeah. But still enjoying that audience interaction. It was oh, great. totally. Yeah. And you are both new to the Chamber Theater. We as are. I understand yes. it. So what is, yes. what's, what's it been preparing a, a play like this that has historical relevance, um, this very political resonance in our, yeah. our in our current moment as new members of the chamber theater. Yeah, well I think it first of all it's so exciting to be a part of a world premiere. Yes. that is specifically about this community. You yeah. know, the Milwaukee Chamber Theater is in the third ward. This bombing was in the third ward. There's so much relevance location-wise that I've I've never really worked on a show where I can be in the same place that it took place, which is really amazing. So it's been really cool to like have that be your home. I say homecoming because I've worked here before. Okay. But to be at Milwaukee Chamber Theater and being able to be like, okay, so we're a part of this story that took place over there and over there and at uh, the Cactus Club. Like there's just all these places that still exist today. So it's really cool to be a part of that. Specifically, the police station was on Oneida Street. So for native Milwaukeeans or folks that live there now, that's where we're talking about. King, are you from Milwaukee? What's it like working with the Chamber Theater? Yeah, so I moved to Milwaukee from Kenosha, originally born and raised in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, a bit more up north. Yep. Um, But I had never known that this was any sort of event that happened in Milwaukee I hadn't I heard about it. it. Exactly. People from Milwaukee have told us, what are you talking about? Yeah, I'm saying, absolutely. come see the play. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> then you'll know. <laughs> yeah. So it was absolutely wild to, to work on this. And then we actually were able to do a little tour for ourselves yeah. and go to the actual places where it happened. And, it, you know, That's and right awesome. now it's just a it's just a normal four way intersection. Street, yeah. You know? Yeah. And to be like so much happened here. Yes. That is no and that is no longer there. But yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things about Milwaukee and a lot of places in Wisconsin. Um, there's a lot of very current, currently relevant places mm-hmm. that now look like it wasn't a place where history happened before. And yeah. it's across the state, in fact, which I think is really cool. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, uh, uh, Kelsey, that it's four different storytellers trying to tell the same story. Yep. And that imme- immediately pinged a whole bunch of things in my head, right? Um, we all come from different lived experiences. Mm-hmm. And so how we actually experience the same event is influenced by who we are and the perspective that we bring to it. Right. So to a theater goer, right? There's all of it. What's it like trying to, in an ex- where there's extemporaneous elements help people reflect upon the way that we tell stories and the way that we remember events because it's it's deeply infused in who we are and what we bring to the table at each of those moments. Well, I think what's amazing about the the four actors specifically that are in this production is we are coming from four incredibly different backgrounds. And so even just seeing that picture on stage immediately tells us, okay, we're going to be getting some different perspectives here. And on top of that, we brawl with each other about mm. how to tell this story, which I say brawl, I mean challenge, really. We challenge each other on a lot of things because of our lived experiences. So it's yeah. kind of this fun life imitates art moment as an audience member being like, oh, I'm actually following what this person's storyline is. But wait, I'm not thinking of it in that way because yes. I'm coming from this perspective. I think that's so deeply important. One of the one of the challenges I think that we have in this political moment is how do we let people open themselves up mm-hmm. to trusting and believing the lived experiences of others without that becoming personally threatening? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Doing that through art and theater is one of those safe places. I hope for people, what brought you to theater King? Why is this, why the chamber theater now? What's your hopes for the future? Yeah. The, the one thing I very much when you're saying love about theater is that it lets us see lives that we may not ever see unless we actively go out and venture into the places, you know? Uh, and so doing shows that are diverse, that have impacts of, and tell stories of different lives that are not my own, but also as an actor, being able to work with other people who are not like me and learn from that. I think that what really is what really strove me towards theater and what I really like about Milwaukee Chamber Theater. Like I think reading the script, the only prerequisite for all of our characters is that we were as diverse as we possibly could be, uh, you know? Yeah. 
and that's the only thing we needed. Uh, and it and it so much informed how we how we acted, how we talked to each other, how we uh, digested the script, and how we performed because we were all from diverse backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Now, I have a question as a, an old has been wannabe actor. <laughs> Stop it right now. <laughs> Never too late to act. Right, um, and that is. Do you find yourself in a groove with the script and as you go through rehearsals or, and, and that's true. I think inevitably there is a groove. You, the director's giving you notes. Okay. I want to hit and I got to hit my marks, whatever it is. Yeah. But I always found that in each performance, something new would happen or I would pick up something different from one of my fellow actors and something would be a little different. Do you go in with intentionality for that or are you just kind of letting it happen? I think the hope for me is I'm just kind of letting it happen. But when you have a show that includes the audience, so much of it, right, is like, I'm looking at this person. They clearly don't want me talking to them. So I need to pivot elsewhere because I don't want them to never come to the theater again, right? Like you don't want to traumatize people and turn them away from this. It's like she just wouldn't stop talking to me and I'm never coming back. But um, yeah, your turn. (laughs) Uh, For me, it's like, it's letting those things happen. And and responding to them in in the moment, mm. uh, being present to that, yeah, you know. But if something miraculous happens on stage that completely changes or pivots the scene, like that is a great discussion to have after the fact and see if it's something we want to continue on, you yeah. know, yeah. Because uh, the the joy of live theater is that it's live. Yes, it's yeah. By just the very nature of it, never going to be the same and always going to be different every night, you know. And so relishing and, and living in those things is very nice. One of the things that I remember is that there is a distinct like electricity and also smell that I think is almost universal <laughs> to like all backstages. I don't know oh, what yeah. it totally. is. It's <laughs> yes. like it's, and then there's that little like theater breeze that comes through and you're like, we're about to do a show, <laughs> yes. right? And you get all jazzed. Oh, yes. The spirits. Yes. <laughs> it's very Phantom of the Opera. Yes, <laughs> it's just totally. like, it's happening. Um, the playwright here is Martin Zimmerman. He is best known for his work as a writer and producer on the Netflix hit shows Ozark and Narcos. Everybody right now is like, oh, it's the guy that wrote Ozark and Narcos? I gotta go see this. Yeah. Did you have interactions directly with Mr. Zimmerman in, in oh, getting... Yeah. Okay. Yes. Tell oh, me yeah. about I mean, what we, that's we, like. we all went out to eat yesterday and yeah. grabbed a beer. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's been wonderful having him there because I think since he's been a part of these writers' rooms, right, where there's 10 to 15, yes. however many people, he is not precious about anything in the room, oh, which is a blessing so, to have because sometimes, sometimes you know, unique. and you need that, right? Especially with the new play process to have him in the room and be like, you know what, that's not working, let's cut it. Or you know what, I really liked what you just did there, let's add that in, yes. is really awesome because sometimes you're in the room with playwrights who just get a little too precious about a lot of stuff and it's never my personal. Words. I know, it's I know. Like, don't oh, change my words. You're chopping it all up. <laughs> but he's been fantastic and I think it's it comes from just working in those rooms and there's just that time constraint. Like we need to, we need to yes. produce something fantastic Urgency. and nothing's personal. Yeah. Yep. Are you finding it also King to be collaborative and open to these moments of creative aha and, and, and creative input? Absolutely. You know, there, there's been several points in, in the play process where we all just stop and we're like, does this actually make sense? <laughs> yeah. You know, we have like hour long conversations yeah. about this one particular moment in this show. Yeah. And then we discuss and we rewrite and we do it again and we feel it out and we get the time to work out all the kinks so that it makes sense, which I think is a joy and a wonderful thing you have yeah. that you don't get to do with uh, a play that has been published and and, mm-hmm. and done there. a million times. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that's the reason that I was so fascinated is to have a playwright and then a director as well. Mm hmm. And each of you, you've got a lot of artists with a lot of lived experiences all coming together to try to do this thing that has never been done before, which leaves open so much possibility yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, for each of you as collaborators and artists. I, I love to see that. Um, I wanted to know a little bit more about, and I'll start with you, King. Yeah. We'll probably get to you, Kelsey, after a couple of messages. Yeah, but probably. what what for you w- was the thing? the the moment or the play or the teacher or professor that really made you say, I want to be, this is what I want to do. It's not a hobby. 
this is who I am. Yeah, I'll I'll do a quick plug. Um, I saw my first professional fully done production of Shakespeare. Mm. It was Much Ado About Nothing at American Players Theater in Spring Green, Wisconsin. APT. APT. Yep. We gotta love it. Um, and I, I that after doing that, I was in I was a sophomore in, in high school. I was doing theater, and it's something I like to do. And I saw it, and I'm like, this is what I want to do, you know. And then in college, I got the chance to uh, do an internship there as a production oh. assistant. So I got to see all the people who I was fawning over, you know. Yes, yes. And then I got there, and I was like, oh yeah, this holds true. This is exactly the kind of community and the theater that I want to do uh, this thing. And so it's been my striving a goal to be a part of, you know. Mm. Uh, so the Milwaukee Chamber has that collaboration, that diversity there that, that I really enjoy a lot. Yeah, Spring Green. I mean, uh, the trips in high school. I went to Rufus King, which is a 19th and Capitol, and they had this wonderful uh, theater department. And we do at least one or two trips oh, to yeah. Spring oh, nice. Green yes. to see the performances. And it's in the round if you've not, if people that are listening haven't been there, which um, when you're doing Shakespeare, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, uh huh. This this is how they did did it back then, and oh, we're semi outdoors and the <laughs> yep. elements, the and, elements. Yeah, yep. yep. <laughs> Couple of times it's drizzly and cold as all get out at spring green, you know, because Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kelsey, we're going to ask you that question when we come back after a couple of quick messages. I'm Maggie Dawn. You're listening to the Civic Media Radio ne- Network. My two guests, stars of the. New production running April 26th to May 12th at the Milwaukee Chamber Theater. The play is called The Not-So-Accidental Conviction of 11 Milwaukee Anarchists. Don't go anywhere. The Friday fun continues after these brief messages. Welcome back, Wisconsin. I'm Maggie Dawn. This is the Civic Media Radio Network. I'm joined this half hour by two stars of the Milwaukee Chamber Theater's newest world premiere of the play, The Not-So-Accidental Conviction of 11 Milwaukee Anarchists. The run of that play is April 26th to May 12th at the Broadway Theater Center in Milwaukee, Milwaukee's Third Ward. It was written by playwright Martin Zimmerman, worked as a writer and producer on the hit shows on Netflix, Ozark and Narcos. This is going to be fun. Very fun. I now will be buying tickets. Avi. Yes. Kelsey, before the break, we asked you your partner in creativity. King, what was the moment, the play, the teacher or series of them that made you think, "Uh, I, this isn't just a hobby. I want to be an actor. Yeah. So, I went to a uh, vocational high school and they had a performing arts program. And so I auditioned to get in. I used a monologue, I think from our town and I did not have (laughs) it. Is is the radio sound for cliche? I know. I know. Literally. (laughs) And I did not have it memorized. It was, I just, it just went very poorly, but I just had this full emotional life and my teacher at the time was just like that's why I took you because you just started oh. crying for no reason because you thought that that would be good acting and I was like <laughs> okay wow way to just drag me but anyway I got into the program miraculously and I remember we were doing monologue work on something and the person that I was playing was a bad I put bad in quotation marks yes. right a bad person right and I remember her saying well you can't just approach this person as bad What's happened to them? Yeah. What was their lived experience? What what occurred in their life that made them this way? We got to justify them, which is really ironic because we were just having these conversations in rehearsal. And it was kind of like that, that checking of myself where I had to be like, oh, um, I guess I don't know a lot more than I thought. Mm. And I think that challenge is really what drew me to it where I was like, okay, so I can get to engage with a bunch of different people about a bunch of different things and learn 
Yeah. It not just be about applause or, you know, just looking pretty on stage yes. and all this stuff, but really like getting to know my community in a different way, getting to know people in a different, yes. deeper way and not just approaching everything from a know-it-all perspective, which I was definitely very guilty of in high school. And so that just kind of like branched me into being like, okay, now's the time to just continue to learn and play and see where that can take me. Yes. Yeah. I love the fact that um, theater, especially, if you've got someone that allows you to explore, not just what's the character's motivation, mm -hmm. why are they saying this thing, is it realistic? Mm -hmm. But each character, if well-written and well-developed and part of the central plot line, yeah. will have complexity. And mm -hmm. no one shows up as simply good or bad or beautiful or ugly. Right. Mm -hmm that we all have these dualities and all of these elements within us and trying to figure out all those complexities and share them with an audience as an actor yeah. is really beautiful. I'm that's, that's wonderful that you had a high school teacher that helped you find that. Yeah. Cultivated it's, that very early on. It's really humbling, right? Like yeah. at the root of that is, Oh, maybe I don't know. I got to think about this pe person and keep turning the prism and seeing it yeah. in different ways. And, and Ironically, I think that that is often our call when we're having discussions about tough stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, can I turn the prism a different way? Am I humble enough yeah. to think about this question in a new way or the way this other person is sharing with me? Mm -hmm. And to see one another not as just one-dimensional right, right. creatures, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, King, uh, we were talking during uh, our brief break that you helped workshop this play. It's been in development for 10 years. What was that experience like? Yeah. Um, last year, around roughly around this time, we had a sort of read through um, with uh, four of the four actors, um, the other two people in the play. Uh, and we kind of just, it was almost like a cutting room kind of exercise uh. where we just read the play and we're like, what makes sense? What doesn't make sense? Cut this, add that, do this. We had, Martin was on the his laptop. The script was projected on the wall, and we were just making live edits and reading reading things. Wow! You know? So it was just like two or three days of just intense reading and cutting, and just trying to make sense of the play before even we put before we even put it up on its feet. You know? Yep. Mm -hmm. and so that was amazing to do. Yeah. What a wonderful exercise! Yeah. Um, I've edited some things on a wall, you know, with, with the words projected, but it was never as interesting as a play. It was like a legal brief. That is, oh, that sure. is, oh, yeah. That is, it can be a little creative, but it's not nearly as an ex, as exciting and, and, and engaging. Creative or dramatic, Maggie? Yeah, well. There you go. <laughs> I'm always dramatic. Well. <laughs> I, I have... I, Nobody has ever come out of a meeting with me and been like, well, she's really boring. She's <laughs> subtle at best. <laughs> well, depends on the room that you're in, Kelsey. Yeah, that's true. No, Very true. I'm no longer working in a law firm. Right? <laughs> um, folks, you can get tickets to this world premiere of the not-so-accidental conviction of 11 Milwaukee anarchists by going to www.milwaukeechambertheater.org backslash anarchists. That's www.milwaukeechambertheater.org backslash anarchists or by phone through the box office at 414-291-7800. 414-291-7800. Last thought, King, before we have to close out the half hour. Um, it is a just an amazing show, amazing play. Um, whether you've done theater or you've not done theater, there's something for everyone in the play and something that you can see yourself in each actor mm. who's trying to digest and process this play. Kelsey? It's a nice, crisp 80 minutes. No oh, intermission. Oh, so yes. you get to come in, hang out, bring your folks, have a great time, catch some dinner afterwards. I love dinner after theater. Yes. Not yes. before. So you it's can talk about early. the show yes. and we might actually come with you yeah. because <laughs> only certain places are open so that we can all talk about it. So please love come. Yeah. No, no sardis in Milwaukee, but uh, we'll, we'll create our own safe space That's right. to have yes. a little discussion Even about Even if it's this. in the lobby. Yes. Well, my great thanks to King Kane and Kelsey Kelsey Elise Rodriguez of the Milwaukee Chamber Theater, two of the stars of their newest production and world premiere starting April 26th, The Not-So-Accidental Conviction of 11 Milwaukee Anarchists. 
Again, the run dates are April 26th to May 12th at the Broadway Theater Center in Milwaukee's Third Ward. For tickets, call 414-291-7800 or go to www.milwaukeechambertheater.org backslash anarchists. I'm Maggie Dawn. You're listening to the Civic Media Radio Network. Don't go anywhere. I've got Milwaukee Common Council woman Jocasta Zamaripo, one of my personal heroes and just an all-around amazing woman joining me at the top of the hour. News, weather, and sports are up next. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.